In this video, I'll discuss the inverse trig functions, arc sine, arc cosine, and arc tangent. I'll define the functions, state their domains and ranges, and talk about solving some problems involving them. In order to understand inverse trigonometry, we have to keep this big idea in mind. And that's that the sine and the cosine curves are these infinite wiggles with a domain extending from negative infinity to positive infinity. They wiggle back and forth, up and down, repeating the same y values over and over again. In order to come up with an inverse for a function like this, we need to restrict that domain. To be more specific, we need to restrict the domain for a section of the curve where the function is one to one where each y value is achieved once and only once. To see what this looks like, I'll start at the high point right here, uh, 0, 1. I'll start to move down the curve, and I'm going to stop when the y values start to repeat back upon themselves. At this point, I'm at x equals pi over 2, and I've achieved every single y value for the cosine curve from 0 to 1, every positive y value, I should say but I haven't achieved the negatives, so I continue. I keep going until I reach x equals pi, and now you can see I've achieved the minimum value of cosine, and I found a suitable domain with which to restrict cosine in order to find an inverse. Of course, to find an inverse, we repeat the procedure that we usually do, and that's reflect this curve over the line y equals x. Here's the squiggle that results after I do that. I'll plot a few points so this is a little easier to understand. This point right here is 1 comma 0. And this point right here where it crosses the y-axis is 0 comma pi over 2. And lastly, this maximum point right here is negative 1 comma pi. If everything seems all turned around where the angles are the y values and the ratios are the x values, that's because they are. We found an inverse. This function is cosine inverse, and it has a domain from negative 1 to positive 1, which was precisely the range of regular cosine, and it has a range from 0 to pi which we showed on the previous slide was how we restricted it. To have a better picture in your head, perhaps, of uh, inverse cosine, you can imagine what would happen if we didn't restrict, and this wiggle would just continue, wrapping around the y-axis instead of the x. Let's do some examples using inverse cosine. I have here pictured the unit circle that we can use to help. But keep in mind that we only want to use the region of the unit circle from 0 to pi because that is the range of our insert inverse cosine function. Inverse cosine will never output a value less than 0 or greater than pi. To start, if, we ask, if we're asked to find inverse cosine of negative 1, we're asking to find the angle in which cosine achieves a ratio of negative 1. And we can see that here is pi. The second question asks us to find an angle with cosine achieves a ratio of negative one half. And knowing our unit circle tells us that is two pi over three. We can also find an angle where cosine achieves the value of zero. And that of course is pi over two. Some questions like these ones that are marked with an asterisk require a calculator. So I can input cosine inverse of negative 7 25ths. And if I'm, if I'm in uh, radian mode, my calculator will tell me that this is 1.85 or so radians. Uh, if you're in degree mode, this would be um, 106, about 106 degrees. So that makes some sense if we think about negative 7 25ths as a decimal. Uh, it's about negative 0.28, so we might be like right about here, 106 degrees. Uh, meanwhile, we need a calculator for secant inverse of 5 thirds as well. However, there is no secant inverse button on most calculators. For this, you'll need to know that 
uh, secant has the reciprocal ratio of cosine. So I can rewrite this problem as cosine inverse of the reciprocal ratio, three fifths. Note that I'm not reciprocating uh, cosine inverse, I'm reciprocating the ratio. Uh, and when I do that in radians, I'll get about uh, 0.93 radians or about 53 degrees. And that makes sense because the ratio of three fifths is about 0.6. That would put us right about here or so. Let's move on to inverse sine. Inverse sine is very similar to inverse cosine. Still, we start with a sine curve. Uh, an infinite wiggle extending from negative infinity to positive infinity. And we look for a region to restrict that function so that we can find an inverse. Uh, note that uh, once again, we have this problem um, of the function not being one to one, uh, but the problem is a little different than last time. If I try restricting sine on the interval from zero to pi, like I did with cosine, uh, I will not come up with a good candidate for an inverse because this little blue wiggle that I drew here is not one-to-one. -one. Uh, not only that, um, it also doesn't achieve the entire range of the sine function. There's only positive ratios in that portion of the wiggle. It never dips down into the negatives. Um, so a better restricted domain for the sine curve would go from its minimum point here at negative pi over two through the origin up to its maximum point here at pi over two. Uh, and that is precisely the portion of the sine curve that we will mirror over the um, line y equals x in order to find an inverse. And here it is, and this is uh, the function f of x equals sine inverse of x, sometimes called arc sine. Uh, it has a domain from uh, negative one to one, which was exactly the range of the regular sine curve. And it has a range from negative pi over two to pi over two. And I'll plot a few points just so you can kind of see exactly uh, what this curve looks like. It starts here with a lowest point at negative one comma negative pi over two. And then it goes through the origin, there's zero, zero. And then up top here, this is the point one comma positive pi over two. And again, that feels a little backwards because all of the y coordinates are angles where the x coordinates are ratios, but that's exactly what an inverse is doing is taking everything and turning it around. And in fact, if you wanna maybe better uh, draw that graph, you can just imagine uh, continuing to wiggle it around the y axis, just like we did with cosine. Again, we'll take a look at some examples with sine, um, and we'll have our unit circle here for reference. Um, one thing that I would warn about with using the unit circle, we're only using the right half of the unit circle, uh, but more to that point, since we said that the range um, of the sine function was from uh, negative pi over two, negative pi over two up to pi over two, make sure that anytime you're describing an angle down here in the fourth quadrant, make sure that you're just using a negative number uh, to describe that angle um, because you may have grown accustomed to calling um, some of those angles 11 pi over six or seven pi over four. You'll have to use negative angles to describe it now so that it fits snugly in the range of inverse sine. Uh, for example, sine inverse of negative one is asking where is the y coordinate negative one on the unit circle, and it would be at negative pi over two. Uh, just be clear, if you were to say three pi over two, that would be incorrect because uh, three pi over two is not in the range, right? To get to three pi over two, you have to go past pi over two and come around. And we're, we're not allowed to do that. We're only allowed to go forward 90 degrees or backwards 90 degrees with our inverse sine function. Uh, when I'm asked for inverse sine of one half, now I want an angle where the y coordinate is a half and uh, pi over six would do the job there. Uh, for negative one half, I would instead report negative pi over six. 
I wrote pi over 2 before. That should be pi over 6. Negative pi over 6. And for the last couple questions here, I can use a calculator to evaluate sine inverse of 4 fifths. And if um, you are in uh, radian mode, you will get 0 0.93 or 53 degrees if you're in degree mode. On your calculator, you always can toggle back and forth so you can follow the directions carefully. Um, note that that was the same answer that I got for secant inverse of uh, 5 thirds, which was cosine inverse of 3 fifths. And that's not uh, a coincidence because when I draw a triangle and I label the adjacent 3 and the hypotenuse 5, then Pythagorean theorem tells me that the opposite will be a 4. So sine inverse of 4 fifths and cosine inverse of 3 fifths must be the same. Uh, meanwhile, there's no cosecant inverse button on your calculator, but you can execute sine inverse of the reciprocal ratio, and that would give you 1.29 radians. Or if you were working in degree mode, you can switch that over and see that it's about 74 degrees. Notice that I tend to answer things to the nearest degree or the nearest hundredth of a radian. Let's repeat this process one more time with tangent. Uh, tangent notice wiggles a little differently. Um, and this time finding a section of the tangent curve that is one to one is uh, relatively intuitive. Uh, this portion of the curve right here that swoops down through the origin uh, between its two asymptotes is the perfect candidate because it, it achieves the entire range of, of tangent and it doesn't um, double back on itself at all. So it is a one-to-one -one portion of the curve. And that's what we see here. And this is a picture of uh, f of x equals tan inverse, often called arc tan. I'll write that down. I've said that before, but sometimes you'll call these arc sine or arc cosine, or in this case, arc tan of x. Um, that way we make sure we don't confuse this inverse business with reciprocals. When we talked about cotang cotangent before, that was the reciprocal of the tangent function, which is different than the inverse, of course. Um, so the arc tan kind of gives us a new way um, so it doesn't get gobbled up. Uh, note that arctan has a domain of all real numbers, uh, which is different from sine and cosine. Um, and its range, I'll point out, um, it does go from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, but those are not included because there are indeed asymptotes, for, uh, horizontal asymptotes at uh, negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 to match the vertical asymptotes of tangent. We'll tackle some uh, basic problems with tangent here. Again, um, I'll note that you can use the right half of the circle for tangent. So the same warning applies as for sine. Um, we're working here from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So take care that if anything shows up in quadrant four, you're going to express those angles as negatives since we can't go forward beyond pi over two. Uh, so tan inverse of negative one. Um, now I want an angle that has a um, slope of negative one. So that would be negative pi over four, negative 45 degrees. We're working the radians though, so negative pi over four. Um, I want an angle with a slope of zero. So uh, that angle would be zero. And then I want an angle with a slope of negative root three, which is steeper than negative one. And that would be uh, negative pi over three. Do the job there. Uh, for the last one, I can use a calculator, um, but I will say that um, we can have a really good guess at the answer here. Um, I'm looking for an angle with a slope of 1,000, which is going to be like a really, 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 really steep slope. 
right? So I'm going to guess that my answer is going to be very close to pi over 2. Um, when I put it in, um, I see that in degrees, it comes out as 89.9 degrees. And in radians, uh, it comes out to 1.57, which is indeed um, very, very close to 3.14159 divided by 2. Um, so I'll say uh, 1.57 or 89.9 degrees. I'll pause here for a minute with a quick summary of what we've seen before. So far, three new functions, arc sine, arc cosine, and arc tan, with specific domains and ranges that make them actually functions. So uh, we had to restrict the domain of sine, cosine, and tangent in order to create them. Um, I would make sure that you um, are very, very clear on these distinctions, particularly the fact that um, when we're maybe using our unit circle or, or picturing our unit circle, um, that the Arc cosine function lives up here. That means all values um, of, um, every time you evaluate an arc cosine problem, you'll get a value from zero to pi. Meanwhile, both arc sine and arc tan live over here. Arc sine includes the endpoints, arc tan doesn't. Uh, and we already made it a, a clear note about what's going on there in quadrant four, just be careful to make sure you always output negative angles um, for quadrant four. Now we'll take a look at some trickier problems involving inverse trig. Okay, that last statement wasn't entirely true because uh, these three examples are actually about as boring as they get. Uh, each one of these, the answer is entirely obvious. I'm asked to find cosine inverse of cosine of pi over 3, sine inverse of sine of pi over 2, and tan inverse of tan of negative pi over 4. And the answers, not surprisingly, are pi over 3, pi over 2, and negative pi over 4. And the reason for this is I'm composing a function and its inverse. But the reason actually goes a little deeper than that. The catch is, what makes these problems easy is the input values are all inside of the range of the outer function, of the, the inverse trig function, these ranges that we just learned. For cosine inverse, pi over 3 is between 0 and pi. For sine, pi over 2 is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 inclusive. And for inverse tan, negative pi over 4 is in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. The thing is, that's not always the case. And we'll see that in our next example. These three problems are a little bit more difficult. First, I'm asked to find the sine inverse of sine of 7 pi over 8. Even though sine inverse and sine are inverse functions, they won't undo each other and spit out the answer of 7 pi over 8. We'll have to look a little deeper to see how they interact. I'm going to draw a unit circle. And I'm going to mark here the range of sine inverse. The answer that I give better be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, or it will automatically be wrong. Then I'm going to mark 7 pi over 8 right here, nearly 8 pi over 8. So sine of 7 pi over 8 is some y value, and I'm actually not quite sure what it is, but it's going to be um, imagined by that little red um, marking right there on my graph. I don't actually know what sine of 7 pi over 8 is, and instead of working it out on uh, my calculator, what I can do instead is I can say that I know that the reference angle for 7 pi over 8, which is a quadrant 1 angle over here, is going to have the exact same uh, y value, right? Because that's what reference angles do. And since the reference angle for 7 pi over 8 is 8 pi over, uh, is just pi over 8, that's the answer to my problem. Sine of 7 pi over 8 asks me to find a y value, a ratio that produces this particular angle. Inverse sine asks me to find an angle that produces the same ratio within negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And that's precisely what I just did. In the next example, I have to do that for cosine. 
course, this time I'm gonna put a little marking up here because this is where inverse cosine lives. If I don't answer with an angle between zero and pi, I know it will automatically be wrong. And this time I'm presented with an angle of six pi over five, which is like 216 degrees. That's like here somewhere. Okay, and then I'm gonna make a little marking right about this way. I'm going horizontal because cosine's an x coordinate, right? So what I wanna find is an angle between zero and pi that has the same exact x coordinate. So I'm gonna imagine throwing it across right up here. Notice this time I'm not looking for a reference angle. And the reason for that is I know that cosine of six pi over five is some negative value. So I'm looking for a quadrant two angle that has that same x coordinate. So I can use some uh, thought here. I know this is five pi over five. It's pi, and then this angle that I marked was six pi over five. And so that means the angle that I'm looking for is four pi over five. It's the angle that has the same x coordinate as six pi over five that fits snugly in inverse cosine's range. Lastly, I have a tangent problem. So I'll draw another unit circle. Remember tangent I'm thinking about as slope and inverse tangent lives over here. That means the answer to my problem better be between negative pi over two and pi over two. Uh, 11 pi over 10 is actually very similar to six pi over five. It's a little bit bigger, just a little tiny bit bigger than pi. So here's 11 pi over 10. <clears throat> Okay, um, now I need to find um, a slope. So here we are. This is the slope of the line that goes through 11 pi over 10. And if I continue that slope on the other side of the curve, what you'll see is I'll hit uh, a spot in inverse tan's range that has the exact same slope as 11 pi over 10. And because the reference angle for 11 pi over 10 is pi over 10, that's the angle that I'm looking for. As you saw in our last example, compositions of trig functions can get a little bit tricky. Um, here we have some problems where the composition's working the other way and things are mixed and matched. So it's not just sine of sine inverse, uh, but this time I have tan and cosine inverse kind of mixing together. Um, these problems aren't too bad if you have the right approach for them. So the thing to note is that this function on the inside is going to output an angle. And I don't need to find that angle. I need to find tan of that angle. Uh, so what I do when I'm solving a problem like this is I draw a picture. And the picture that I draw rather than a unit circle is a triangle. That way I can visualize the angle and I see what ratios are, are being used. All right, so cosine inverse of one half, it's an angle and it's an angle that has uh, an adjacent of one and a hypotenuse of two, all right? And um, what I could say then is, well, uh, two squared minus one squared is three, so the square root of three is the opposite, all right? And then remember that I'm actually not looking for this angle. I mean, I know that this angle is 60 degrees or pi over three because I know about this special right triangle right here, but I don't need to know that. That's not even necessary because I'm not asked to find the angle. What I'm asked to find is the tan of the angle. And so when I drew the triangle, I got everything that I needed. I got the opposite and I got the adjacent. And that's precisely what you need for the tangent of the angle. So the answer to this problem is just root three over one or root three. In the next example, I'll draw another triangle because again, sine inverse of three halves is requesting some angle. I don't have to actually find the angle. Maybe you remember that it was 53 degrees because we did that problem a little bit earlier. Um, or actually, it's uh, 37 degrees, I believe. We did uh, 
we did sine inverse of four fifths. What I want to know again is tangent of the angle. So I draw my picture here. The sine is three fifths, so opposite over adjacent. I use the Pythagorean theorem to find, um, I meant to say opposite over hypotenuse. I use the Pythagorean theorem to find the adjacent side. And the question at hand is to find tangent of that angle. So now I need opposite over adjacent, and that is three fourths. Uh, one last problem and one last triangle. This time I'm asked to find sine of secant inverse of nine, just because uh, we might not be so familiar with secant inverse. I'll rewrite this as cosine inverse of the reciprocal. So it's sine of cosine inverse of one ninth. So I'm talking about an angle that has an adjacent of one and a hypotenuse of nine. And that means uh, the y value there is the square root of nine squared minus one squared, which is the square root of 80, also known as four root five. And so I'm asked to find the sine of this angle I've got the opposite, I've got the hypotenuse, that means I've got the answer for root 5 over 9. That's it. Hope you enjoyed the video.